The Maestro by William Marcourt. The young man climbed up the last steep incline and paused as he reached the top. For a moment he stood and looked around. Yes, this was the perfect spot. He doffed his backpack, removed his boots, tough jeans, jacket, and shirt, and reaching into the backpack, took out a plastic bag. With this in hand, he went to the edge of the plateau. There he untied the cord and opened the bag and took out soap, washcloth, towel, electric razor, and hairbrush. Looping the cord around the handles of the bag, he lowered it into the water, filling it up about half full. Hanging it from the limb of a small bare tree, he proceeded to wash and groom himself. Once done, he emptied the bag and placed everything back in, returning to the backpack. He dressed then in formal trousers, stiff white shirt, and swallowtail coat, adding black socks and shiny dress shoes. It would not do to conduct the symphony in other than appropriate attire. He then packed the other clothes and the plastic bag in the backpack and dropped it beside a rock. Once again, he walked to the center of the plateau. There he spent some minutes looking around. Yes, there were many fish in the lake below and colorful birds flying around. And there, facing him across the lake, the natural formation that looked so like a giant owl. To him, this was the goddess Athena Minerva. He would direct his symphony and praise and supplication to her, so it would be a silent one. No musical instruments were there. All music would be in his mind. No need for sound. She would hear. And if his mind music pleased, she would grant his prayer. This would be the greatest symphony ever written, surpassing all that came before. Closing his eyes and tilting his head back, he visualized the work, seeing the notes, the orchestra, the huge concert hall. He raised his arms, paused, and began. His arms moved, directing violins, then the flutes, the horns, the cellos, each section of the orchestra. He heard the sounds, the blending, the short solos, the soft, peaceful singing of the strings, then the music, growing music, building to crescendo, and the percussion sections hammering out the martial beat that blended into a great, sublime anthem of praise and exaltation. As his arms moved, he slowly opened his eyes. Above him, the birds were flying in frantic circles that gradually unwound into a string of colors swiftly disappearing off into the distance. Looking down, he saw that the fish were echoing the movement of the birds, circling madly around the lake and then following the leaders away, downstream, he knew not where. He was caught in the spell of his own making, arms moving faster and faster as the music he heard grew wilder, louder, almost warlike. And then he came to the end of his symphony in the frantic cases. Everything became calm, and the work ended in peace and harmony. The release from the spell left him limp, almost too weak to remain standing. Gradually, his breathing slowed, and he raised his head. Across the lake, the owl-like formation stood, unchanged. But no, it was not quite the same. A huge, human-like hand had appeared at the bend of one wing. Slowly, it moved up to the beak, then turned palm up, and moved slightly toward him. He felt a wash of love and blessing flow over him, and in his mind he heard, Well done, I, we, accept this offering, this Athena Minerva symphony. Though in peace, it will be honored wherever it is played. For a moment he stood and stared, then bowed deeply, whispering, Thank you, my goddess. Sighing, he turned to his backpack to change into the tough clothes for the descent back to a mundane world and a lifetime of success.